Hi, everyone. I'm Matt Wilson, Principal Product Manager for the Group Threat Insights team. And I'm going to talk through our Getting Started with Application Security Guide, give a little bit more context. So this guide was created not necessarily as a rigid set of best practices or steps you have to follow in order, but it's more of a recommendation in case you have a customer or a team that's not sure where to get started with application security scanning and some of our compliance pieces. This is just a one recommended order of operations. We think that this is something that will help smooth out some of the friction points in getting started and gradually introduce a lot of the features in a reasonable order. So of course you can choose to skip over some of the pieces or omit features that may not apply to your specific needs or customer use case. But in general, this should be a, a pretty good place to, um, to get going if you're not really sure where to get started. So the very first recommendation is just start small and start easy. So that means secret detection and dependency scanning. Secret detection is really about identifying any potential leaked secrets that you might have in your code base. So this could include things like passwords, SSL certificates, or say an AWS token. Dependency scanning is about looking for any libraries, third-party code that you may have and you may be using that have existing known vulnerabilities. Now, for these in all of our scanners, the very first thing that you should make sure to do is have scan set up against the default branch for any project that you are using security scanning. The reason for doing so is that this creates a baseline. The baseline scan is really essentially cataloging all the vulnerabilities that are already in that project's default branch. We use this when comparing feature branches, like let's say a developer is working on something new, they create a new branch and they have an MR, in that merge request, we have a security widget. We try to display only the findings that are relevant to that particular branch. And we do this by comparing against that baseline. If we don't have that baseline scan of the default branch, what will happen is all of the existing vulnerabilities that were already in the code base when that branch was created will show up like they were newly introduced by the developer. That, of course, is it's not very user friendly and it's it's very noisy because that's a lot of it is irrelevant to the work they're currently doing. So always make sure whenever you are adding any sort of scans to your feature branches, you have the same scans running and enabled for that project's default branch as well. So back to these two analyzers or scanners, we recommend secret detection first because it's very simple. There's not a lot of configuration or setup needed. It only has one analyzer, which is the engine that actually scans the code. Other scan types like static analysis have different analyzers for each language. So that's not the case with secret detection. There's no build requirements and the findings are pretty straightforward. You can look at what it found and easily determine, is this really something I need to care about? Like, is this an actual leaked password or is it not? Dependency scanning is also a good practice to enable early on because you want to know the existing risk inside of your code base. So vulnerabilities that are disclosed about packages you're using after you may have already built and released the software are really important to have an understanding of like, maybe I need to go back and fix these quickly. And it also is something you, since you want to do that scanning of every feature branch, so you can start tracking any new introduced dependencies, you wanna make sure that you've got that enabled for your main project branch as well. Now, after you get some of the basic scanning, some of these next steps are really more about introducing a vulnerability triage and management workflow. You wanna make sure that teams are comfortable with vulnerability reports. Hopefully you started small and really only enabled some of these scanners for maybe a test project, let's say, or if you have a, an application that may be very important production application, I would recommend creating a fork or a clone of that project so that you're not doing all of this new setup and testing on a, I guess a live actively developed high visibility project. And the reason for this is it allows you to work out sort of these processes and some of the rough edges that can occur when you're trying to roll out any sort of new process. So you can introduce your AppSec teams, your security teams 
to things like the vulnerability reports so they can get a sense for what this looks like as information is presented to them from project default branches. You can also consider offering things like setting up workflows. Leveraging GitLab's labels and our issue boards can really help create a way for the AppSec team and the development teams to really collaborate. So I would recommend issues as the place where you track work to remediate vulnerabilities, potentially on an engineering team. Whereas the vulnerability reports are where you do the initial assessment and triage and then create issues from there. Now, is this, this would be a good time to mention that one of the things that we have seen in interviews with customers that successfully onboarded quickly to GitLab's security and compliance tools is having a sort of internal champion on both the security team and the development team. When you have champions in the departments that are impacted by these kinds of changes and new feature rollouts, you have sort of a single point of contact, but you also have somebody that can represent the needs of the various stakeholders and work across departments to help make this process even smoother. So that may be something you want to consider identifying as you start rolling out these processes with your customers or advising them on how to kind of get up and running, since this obviously affects both security and development departments. Now, once you have a set of representative projects, you've been scanning for a while, you've gotten comfortable with some of the vulnerability management workflows, you can start moving towards some of the more, let's say, automated features and controls. Schedule pipelines, for instance, are a great way to look at branches who may not have a lot of activity. This could be your project main branch, but it may also be something like a maintenance release branch. These long-lived branches are not going to see a lot of active development, and that means they're probably not going to have a lot of regular pipelines as the results of you know, commits or merging to. So having regular scheduled scans, especially for things like dependency scans and container scans, will allow you to surface any newly disclosed vulnerabilities that are already in that particular branch or in that part of your repository. So that's just a general good best practice to consider implementing. It's not really necessary for scans that are looking at your application code, such as static analysis, because those would have hopefully already been run during the feature development process and wouldn't find anything new at this point. You can now move on to some of the compliance focus pieces. So we have scan result policies, which is really just a way to limit new risk from entering into your project's main branch. This allows security teams to control what their threshold for risk is without having to be involved directly in the development process. So for instance, you may decide that critical vulnerabilities are to be, are uh, require a review from designated approvers and a security group as part of this policy definition. That means that engineering teams wouldn't be blocked and con can continue along with their uh, the regular development and merging process if they don't have any critical vulnerabilities in the new code that they've introduced. Again, this goes back to why it's so important to have those default branch scans, because we are still comparing this new code, these feature branches against that baseline. So it's important that we have a good idea so that the delta really is reflecting only the new code changes from the engineering teams. You can also encourage monitoring of vulnerability trends. So this is going to allow security and engineering teams to gauge the success of these rollouts of these particular scanning tools and processes. Is it going in the right direction? Are we seeing a burn down of existing vulnerabilities and are we preventing new ones from entering into the code base? It's also important to make sure that our customers understand that these features exist at the project and the group level. So you can monitor these kinds of trends on the security dashboard at the group level. You can also see a, a high level roll up of vulnerabilities by severity. So you can quickly see your hotspots where you may have more criticals than you would like, for instance. The vulnerability report in particular is very powerful at the group level, especially as you move up to top level or root groups. You can have wide visibility into, you know, if you have one single root group, it could be your entire organization's worth of vulnerabilities. At this point, 
it potentially might make sense to look at other scan types. Now, this is again going to depend on your particular customer or group's balance for how thoroughly they need to scan or what they feel comfortable with. So things like static and dynamic analysis, fuzz testing or container scanning, some of these can be a little bit more complex to set up or require more tuning and rule configuration. That's why we don't necessarily recommend them upfront. Static analysis is something that many organizations and security teams are already familiar with. So there is a tendency to want to set that up and turn it on very close to the beginning of the process. However, because of the level of rules tuning and adjustments, that may not be a good first place to start. It's definitely another one where we would recommend starting on a test project or a limited subset of your projects internally instead of just rolling it out everywhere because it can unfortunately be a little noisy without that tuning and configuration. Compliance pipelines and scan execution policies are enforcement mechanisms to make sure that scans are being run. Now, there are some differences in between the two. If you look at our compliance pipeline documentation, you can see a handy link to the difference between uh, the two. If we look here, so compliance framework pipelines, just at a high level, it's just a CI file. So you can run any of the analyzers, but you can also run any of our external or an external scanner as well. So this might be one of our approved security or our official security partners. It could be a homegrown tool at your customer. That's not something available with scan execution policies. One of the things that scan execution policies are recommended for is if you need configuration at the project level. Now this often happens with things like static analysis where the language and the configuration of a particular project requires different tuning from other projects. You can create a policy per project to enable this. With a compliance framework, the labels that you apply to your various projects pull in the same CI file. So while they're a little bit easier to apply across a broad selection of projects, you don't get that flexibility to customize the behavior per project. And then finally, scan execution policies are great if you need to run regular scans because you can actually schedule them as part of the policy creation. So that dependency scanning on a regular basis I mentioned, this would be a good solution to leverage there. And then finally, you're getting pretty far down the line in terms of the advanced functionality. Customers can take advantage of things that do definitely require a little bit more advanced setup and configuration like review apps. These are great for longer running scans like dynamic analysis or our fuzz testers because you can set them to run on these ephemeral test environments, the review apps, so you don't actually have to push the code forward to a staging or even a production environment where the potential performance impact from these types of analysis could be detrimental. It's also great because you can, you have the option to do things like a lighter profile dash scan as part of the development process. So you can actually get that feedback much earlier than you can with a lot of traditional tools that would do a dynamic scan only on a final deployed environment. And then finally, operational container scanning. Again, this is one where it may vary based on your particular needs because it does require use of Kubernetes and the GitLab agent for Kubernetes in those clusters. But essentially it allows you to point out at the production cluster, it will scan the deployed images for any vulnerabilities and it brings us back into the centralized vulnerability report for the project which you have configured it through. So I hope that was helpful. Again, this is a sort of loose suggested order of operations. It, it's always good to understand upfront the requirements of your particular customer and their use case. And aside from these, as I mentioned, people can be just as important as process in this. Make sure you have the right folks identified upfront and involved. And hopefully this will help for a faster and smoother rollout of some of the GitLab security and compliance features.